Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Unleavened Bread Bible Studies with David Eels. God bless you folks. Thank you for joining us for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. We appreciate you so much. We hope you're praying for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we, um, we ask your grace and your mercy upon our understanding today. We pray, Lord, that you will uh, have mercy upon us and uh, give us the grace to have the renewed mind of Christ, Lord. Oh, Lord. Lord, your word, your truth so motivates us to run after you, Lord. But the deceptions that are out there, Lord, take all that away. Cause people to be satisfied with the world and and far, far less of you than what you offer. So, Lord, we're just asking you to open our understanding and uh, let us be motivated by the truth. Let your truth live in us, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've been speaking about um, the real good news. And um, some times as opposed to the false good news, right? The real good news. And we've discovered, folks, that the real good news is that the Lord has accomplished all of this for us. The works were finished from the foundation of the world, and we just enter into those works through faith. It's already done. We've, we discovered that the Lord's already healed us. He already took away our sins. He already delivered us from the curse. He already provided our every need. All these things are done according to the the real good news. You know what? One thing that helped me to really respect the real good news was how much the devil hated it and how much the devil is afraid of it. The Lord has taught me that, that uh, he hates it. He's afraid of it. He speaks against it. His ministers, whom he fashions as ministers of righteousness, they hate it. They speak against it. And it's, it's a, a war going out there, folks, going on out there. Years ago, I was uh, beginning to teach on this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And the Lord taught me a lesson. I want to share it with you. Well, I started out um, that evening. Uh, a lady joined us that uh, I had never, uh, had never been in our meeting before. But um, she came into the meeting, and uh, she sat down right next to me, as a matter of fact, right next to the, the mic as we were recording it. And uh, she began to ask me a question. She says, um, David, what is all this about tongues? And I said to her, well, tongues is a gift from God by which the Holy Spirit speaks through us according to the will of God. And uh, it's a wonderful gift because the Holy Spirit doesn't know how to ask anything in unbelief. And the reason it's in tongues is because in that way we don't know what we're saying, so we're not tempted to change it, like our theology or our thinking. Uh, many pr people who prophesy, for instance, have um, the temptation of prophesying in part because their theology gets in there because they know what they're saying. But, of course, when you speak in tongues, you don't know what you're saying, so you don't have any motivation to change it. That's the reason for tongues. It's not because you're trying to get something by the devil. It, you're, it really has nothing to do with that. But anyway, I explained this to her, and see, so she you know, accepted that explanation for the moment. But we were just getting ready to start into our meeting. So uh, I was speaking on the gospel, and I learned that day just how much the devil hates the gospel and uh, how he's warning against it. I begin in, in Romans 1.16 where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, which is the good news. For 
It is the power of God unto salvation. To every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed a righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, but the, the righteous shall live from faith, or by faith. Um, so, uh, first thing you want to look at is, who is he talking to? Is he talking to the world, or is he talking to his people? Well, it says in verse 7, To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. Called saints. So we see he's not talking to the world and offering this power of God unto salvation to the world. He's offering it to the beloved of God, the saints of God. I know that people have sometimes a very simplistic idea of this verse, and they would like it to mean that this is only talking about sinners coming to the Lord. But actually, we need salvation every day. And um, many, uh, many people who sell God far short and themselves far short would like salvation to be a little line that you step over when you make some kind of a commitment towards the Lord. And um, from then on, you always count on stepping over that line. It has nothing to do with your motivation to continue to walk in that salvation. Well, the word salvation, uh, soteria, it, it uh, as a Greek man once told me, he said, it means all my needs supplied, like a little baby. And literally in the Bible, you know, it is actually the noun of the verb sozo, save. And uh, in the Bible, it's used for uh, deliverance, salvation, um, preservation, um, healing. It's used for all that. They're all a part of salvation, according to the scriptures, but I'm not going to go back over that territory, okay? You can go back and listen to the previous uh, uh, teachings if you want. But um, all of this is provided in salvation, and it's something that we need every day. But you know, there are so many people that that um, see salvation is only something that was manifested when they got saved. Well, you know, there was something that happened when we got saved. Our spirit got saved, and uh, which enabled us to walk in the kingdom with this renewed spirit. But the Bible still teaches that our, our soul has need of sanctification, that, that your, uh, your soul is born again through your obedience to the truth. Uh, Peter teaches. And so that's where we got to bear the fruit, folks. And uh, this is why we need salvation. If you look very closely, it says here, the power of God unto salvation. The good news is the power of God unto salvation. And he's speaking to people who are called saints, the beloved of God. So unto salvation lets you know that um, that there is a manifestation that we're expecting down the road. Now, now a lot of people don't expect that manifestation. They believe and they confess uh, that they have been saved, that they have been delivered, and so on and so forth, and they believe that that is manifestly so instead of by faith so. And this is a terrible mistake, and it's, it's uh, something that the devil has done to deceive the church and blind them um, to the great glory of God that he wants to give us through uh, continuing to walk in the gospel. Well, you know, when I got to this point where I spoke about unto salvation, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll read one more verse here. In uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, I uh, pointed out that unto salvation is not talking about something in your past. This is something coming down the road. Well, 1 Peter 2 and 1 says, Putting away therefore all wickedness and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking as newborn babes. Obviously, he's talking about somebody who's been born again already, right? As newborn babes long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile, that you may grow thereby unto salvation wow that's interesting so here's somebody that's born again who needs to grow unto 
salvation, which is the same thing we see back over in Romans, right? Unto salvation. Well, um, uh, notice that we have to grow thereby. We put away uh, wickedness. We put away guile. We put away hypocrisies and envies and, and evil speakings. And, and like newborn babes, we grow unto salvation. Some versions don't have unto salvation here. But I've looked in the numeric, and I've shared with you in the past. Some of you may be listening uh, fresh today, so I'll explain it to you. Numerics is a system that God used to write the Bible with. And um, in the Old and New Testament, he used the Hebrew and Greek letters, which are also their numbers, which lets you know that the whole Bible has been written in numbers. And so there's a pattern going through the whole Bible that can be destroyed if you take one letter out or add one letter in. And there's a numeric pattern in this text that is broken unless you put these words unto salvation in them. See, some people are very proud of their own Bible, their own translation, but the point is that in the ancient manuscripts, there these words are there, unto salvation. And the numeric pattern proves that they're there, unto salvation. And uh, so we see here that, that even after you're born again, as babes, you grow thereby unto salvation. Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. See, some people think, and they've been taught, that uh, they got all they're ever going to get when they received a new spirit. But your spirit is not your soul, folks. And your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. And uh, the Lord has, has planned to manifest his salvation. Let me read a verse to you here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, who by the power of God, which is what? How does it come? Uh, by the gospel, right? Who by the power of God are guarded through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time or the latter end, right? A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So um, he also said in verse 9, he says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Not the beginning of your faith, it's the end of your faith. The beginning of your faith is the salvation of your spirit. But the Lord... Um, sacrificed for us so that we could be born again spirit soul and body soul is is the area of your life that you bear fruit in not your spirit in your soul and you're bearing the fruit of the mind the will the emotions of jesus christ he is salvation okay um so anyway i was speaking on these things and um uh, this woman suddenly when i started to speak actually i heard her just kind of gasp, you know, <sighs> you know, and I looked over at her and I could tell that she was suffering, you know, and that she was even being tormented. And I knew right off when she started that, that she, um, that she was being tormented by demon spirits. So a few minutes later, when I was speaking, uh, again, same thing, uh, whoo, you know, just came out of her mouth, you know, like she was being tormented, you know, and, um, and a few minutes later, as I continued to speak as though that there is a manifestation of salvation in our life, not just receiving it by faith, but a manifestation of salvation in our life. And um, in other words, a manifestation of uh, deliverance, healing, preservation, all these things that God provided for us. Um, you know what this does? This makes people that are satisfied it it takes away their shelter i was thinking of a verse over in isaiah here i'm going to dig it out for you here in isaiah chapter 28 it says in verse um, 14 wherefore hear the word of the lord ye scoffers that rule this people that is in jerusalem because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with sheol are we at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. And falsehood, have we hid ourselves? 
under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, of sure foundation. He that believeth shall not be in haste. And I will make justice the line, and righteousness the plummet. And hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death shall be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then shall you be trodden down by it. There are people that shelter themselves uh, from the conviction of God, from the responsibility that truth brings. They do it with lies. They, um, it takes away their responsibility to be obedient, to be faithful, to manifest anything past that first initial uh, manifestation of Christ to their life. That's that born-again spirit. So that's why people invent these false doctrines to hide under. They invent them because they take away their responsibility. They don't want to be like Christ. And so, you know, for those who love truth and love Christ and desire to see the fullness of the good news and desire for his salvation to be complete, you know, he's able to save to the uttermost or completely, same words, them that draw near unto him. Well, we're being saved spirit, soul, and body. We're being saved uh, 30, 60, and 100 fold because God's fruit is being born in us. But this lady and the spirits that were in her were very angry at what I was saying about salvation being more than just that initial experience with God. She'd stepped over the line. She wanted to be justified where she was. She didn't want to go on with God. And those spirits in her were, of course, deceiving her. And she started saying things out of her mouth. She, first of all, uh, they didn't fit the text of what I was saying. And uh, you, you can tell very easily how demons start manifesting in people. She started saying things that were, that were um, you know, disjointed and so on and so forth. She, um, she said, I'm saved. Christ has cleansed me. You know, the blood of Jesus has, has cleansed me. Don't dispute the blood, she said. Don't dispute the blood. And she spoke these things very harshly. I mean, I was just as calm and quiet as I am right now, speaking and sharing the word and, and um, speaking on Romans 1 and 16. And then she said, uh, all right, Satan, uh, enough, accuser. You know, and of course, these things were coming out of the mouth of somebody who was demon-possessed, you know. And I, you know, this went on for about 13 minutes. She just interrupted, and she'd say something. She'd interrupt, she'd say something. And everybody in the room knew, even, I guess, even the most carnal people that were in the room knew that this lady was demon-possessed and knew that these things the devil was speaking. And what the devil was wanting her to believe was, hey, you've received all you need to receive. There is no manifestation of, of deliverance from sin. You know, there's no manifestation of the uh, of the power of salvation in your life. What you got, that's what you're going to get, and that's all you need. You know, people believe that because they are satisfied. They don't want more of Christ. They don't want him to manifest his salvation. You see, there's something wrong. We all understand that we're saved by faith. But faith is the substance of the thing hoped for while there's no evidence of it seen. Why is that? Well, because if you had the evidence of your salvation, you, you know who you would be? You'd, Christ would be living in you, totally. And you'd be delivered of your sins. And you'd be walking in the Spirit uh, constantly. That's the manifestation of salvation. Some people don't believe that's even possible in this life. They have, instead of receiving salvation by faith, they believe that they've received it by manifestation, which is a very dangerous thing, you know. As long as we're striving for a goal, and that goal is Christ-likeness, and we accept it by faith, Christ will empower us to go there. But if you don't have any expectation of going there or any hope of going there, then you've been short-circuited by the devil. So anyway, the devil just... Um, spoke out and spoke out and, and um, intervened and, and gave the, uh, the greasy grace gospel that many people hear in their churches. Oh, it's all done. It's all, it's all finished. It's all, that's all I'm going to receive, so on and so forth. Well, 
you know, after she spoke for about 14, 15 minutes, I think, on and off as I was speaking, you know, um, I stopped. I bound the demons in her. I, I forbid them to speak through her or torment her. She she spoke out several times about the the light uh, burning her eyes and um, and uh, burning her skin. And uh, well, it was the demons talking. They didn't like the light. They didn't like what we were talking about. They hate the gospel because there's nothing that can really deliver uh, religious or, or uh, foolish Christian people uh, from his bondage except the gospel. He hates it. They don't want to lose their house, folks. They, they want to dwell in the midst of God's people. They want to exalt their throne over the stars of God. And, of course, that's the people of God, according to what God told Abraham. They want to do this, and they don't want to lose their 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 house and um and so they make war they are they put thoughts in the hearts of people uh that they want to hear anyway you know i one time i um uh, i went to a nursing home i'd gone there quite often to preach the gospel and um in one particular nursing home there was a woman there who had um alzheimer's and the Lord told me to pray for her and command the demon to come out of her. And when I did, she spoke for the first time. Anyone in there, you know, had ever heard her speak, you know. I mean, uh, they were all amazed, you know, because immediately she spoke up and, and started talking intelligibly and said, oh, thank you. I really needed that. That was the first words that came out of her mouth. And everybody everybody just looked at her and said, ah, she's never spoken before. You know, they never heard it, you know. Well, that was an Alzheimer's demon you know, that had manifested in her. Well, there was another person in that nursing home. He had been a preacher. And he wasn't all that old, but uh, he also had Alzheimer's. And uh, normally speaking, he was just big trouble. I mean, uh, he was he would wrestle with the nurses and he would just curse and he would just, you know, he was uh, terrible trouble to him. They couldn't handle him. But every once in a while, this guy would start preaching and you could look in his face and know he wasn't doing it with his intelligence. It was demons preaching out of him and he would start preaching that old dead gospel. And, and when you'd hear it, you knew that it was being spoken intelligibly and he was beyond that folks. He, he wasn't even able to do that. He couldn't carry on a sentence or a conversation with anybody. But when he started preaching in between cursings, when he started preaching, you could stop and listen to him. And you could hear, you know, what his church always taught. And it was coming out of the mouth of demons. And every once in a while, they'd just, you know, intersperse with a bunch of cursings in the midst of the whole thing. And, and then he'd go back to preaching. And I'd, I'd ask, I asked several of the people there, I says, does he do this often? They said, yep, all the time. And he's a handful, too. I thought, wow, here's the devil preaching a gospel. It wasn't the real gospel, folks. It was the gospel that you hear in a lot of churches, that you got everything you're going to get. See, see, he hates the true gospel because it's the power of God to save you and me and uh, bring us into the manifestation of Christ and deliver us from the curse of this world. He hates that, and he's going to war against it. He sent a woman in here that was demon-possessed to uh, fight against what he knew I was going to share on that night. And uh, you know what? That woman, she did be quiet. You know, she said a few more words after I bound her. I bound the demons from using her, tormenting her or tormenting us through her. And she said a few more words, and then she shut up for the rest of the teaching. And at the end of that teaching, um, she started speaking again because that's, that's, that's what I did. I bound her until I got through speaking. So she started speaking, and um, I just turned to her and I said, would you like us to pray for you uh, with those tongues that you were speaking about? And I'll tell you something else the devil's afraid of. He's not just afraid of the gospel. He's afraid of you praying over them in tongues because that woman, I mean, is like you lit a fire under her. She jumped up and ran for the door wide open. I never seen anybody cross a room that quick. But she was she hit that door and she was gone. She didn't she said, 
no thank you those three words and by the time she hit you she was going out the door it was that fast and i knew that the devil doesn't like the holy spirit praying over him you know we've had people come here somebody mentioned one the other night a lady that came here and she was obviously full of demons and she she pointed at me i believe it was brother kurt was saying she pointed at me and said i don't want him praying over me <laughs> she said it right off i don't want him praying over me I says, yeah i know why you don't want me praying over you you know well the devil the devil hates he hates the prayer of the holy spirit he hates the word of God, he hates the gospel, and he doesn't mind at all. In fact, he'll give you an anointing to preach that old dead, lying gospel. Do you know that? He'll anoint you to speak that lying gospel because it's a deception. It's an antichrist gospel. The Lord came to conquer this old flesh and live in its place. You know, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, one time I went into a meeting up north of Pensacola, here where I live, and um, I was invited to this meeting. And um, when I came in the door, I I looked down into a woman who was already seated in the in the pew. And she, when I passed by her, she she looked up at me, and I looked down at her, and I looked into her eyes, and I saw demons. And so I didn't say anything. I just walked on down a little further and, and sat down. And, uh, you know, before the meeting started, there was conversation going on in the audience there and so on and so forth, you know. And um, um, this woman spoke up. And I forget what the demon was, but she spoke up and she started speaking the exact same things that I knew that demon was, you know. And uh, so when she got through, she was talking about her problems, you know. So when she got through, I, I, I said to her, I said, ma'am, I says, when I walked by you and I looked into your face, I saw demons in you. You need deliverance. This is your problem. You need deliverance. Well, I know more than got that out of my mouth. Then here comes the preacher. It was a lady. And um, I was standing up as I was saying that. I was going to go over there to her and try to minister to her. And immediately this lady ran in between us, stood in between us, and said something like, let me, let me think, it was, um, we, don't, we don't reveal sins here, we cover them. And I thought to myself, now what has that got to do with anything that we're doing here? You know, I don't understand, you know, but, but she, did, she stopped just long enough for this woman who was, who was on the other side of her to jump up and run out the door as fast as she could run, out the door, gone. And suddenly, it was like this preacher lady got a revelation, and she turned to me, and she looked at me, and she said, I'm so sorry. I said, would you like to go after her? <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. I think she's got too, too good a head start on me. I don't think so. And I just looked at her, you know, and she was very convicted. But you know what? I knew what happened, that the spirit in this woman was covering for that person, uh, hindering. Uh, in order for this to happen, protecting the house of that other demon, you see. And I knew it was something, maybe a, a Jezebel spirit or something like that. But you know what? Uh, later, the, again, uh, she got convicted of that, and, um, and she asked my forgiveness and so on and so forth. But you know what? They cover for one another. You know, I, we were talking here earlier about they're kind of like a wolf pack. You know, they can fight with one another. The demons will fight with one another. But then they'll work together to bring someone down or to hinder the work of God, you know. And what they love to hinder, folks, is the gospel. You know, let me take you to Acts um, 15. Yes. Acts 15 and 11. But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, in like manner as they. We believe that we shall be saved. Now, we're used to saying, I'm saved. And rightfully so, because we're claiming something by faith. We're claiming the deliverance, the healing, the blessing, the, all of the provision of God is associated with his salvation. We're not just, we're not just, we're not saved, as some people think, to sin. We're saved from sin, folks. We're saved from the curse of sin. 
We've been delivered out of the power of darkness, Colossians 1 and 13 says. We're saved from everything that uh, Deuteronomy 28 speaks of, uh, of the curse that's been put upon this world. But there is a manifestation of that salvation. It's God's plan. Faith is, is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's not the, the, it's the substance of the thing hoped for, but God wants to give us the thing hoped for. We're not, we're not meant to walk by faith in what God has given the rest of our life. It's a means to an end. It's supposed to bring us this manifestation of God's salvation. And so the apostles say in here to other people who, who knows, know what he's talking about, other apostles, we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. We shall be saved. Do you know that in the scriptures, it never says that we are saved except when it speaks about us being saved by faith. Faith being the substance of the thing hoped for while there's no evidence seen. It never says that. It's always, uh, uh, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me turn there. Share that little word with you. I want to destroy this false doctrine because it's the foundation of bondage for many, many people. It's that lying gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. He says, I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached, which also you received, and wherein also you stand, and by which also you are, literally it says, being saved. Some of your Bibles have a footnote down there. The Greek note is being saved saved if you hold fast the word which i preached unto you except you believed in vain now you know there's a lot of people don't believe that they can believe in vain they could have believed in vain but it's clear here that if you don't hold fast to the word that was spoken unto you the word of your salvation the faith of your salvation that you just believe for nothing and the word definitely is here uh being saved not saved. It's definitely being saved. Matter of fact, the numeric pattern is in being saved and it's not in saved. There's a word missing there. It ruins the pattern. Okay. I'll tell you this, even the received text, you, you King James only folks out there, let me tell you, you go get your received text and look it up, folks. The received text says the same thing. Now the King James doesn't say that, but the received text does. It says being saved. Wow, isn't that interesting? Well, yes, we are being saved as we hold fast the word that he preached unto us, not the word that we hear nowadays. We're to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, not the faith of our day. Uh, as we hold fast to that gospel, we are being saved. There is coming a manifestation of our deliverance from this curse of sin and death. A manifestation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, which some people have no hope for whatsoever. Wow. Well, look at 1 and 8. Chapter 1 and verse... Excuse me, it's 1 and 18. He says, for the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Okay, both of these words here, to them that are perishing, is what it says in the original, uh, and unto us who are being saved, is what it says in the original. Now, both the numerics, proves that the received text proves that the Nessel's text proves that which the Nessel's text is the three most ancient manuscripts uh, all rolled into one text where two or more agreed they put it in the text it was a very good way to find uh, a true text until numerics came along and it superseded it as the best way to find out the actual text so we've got all the proof in the world that um, that it doesn't say that we are saved but that we are being saved. And uh, if you don't have that hope, 
It can't come to pass. You know why? Because let me point out to you what it says in Colossians. The devil knows how to stop the manifestation of salvation. Listen to this. Verse 21, and you being in time past alienated and enemies in your mind and in your evil works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Reconciled meaning um, an exchange. The original word there means an exchange, meaning in, in, in Christ's body, there was an exchange. He took our curse upon himself, and he gave us his blessing. He took our nature, crucified it on the cross. He gave us his nature. That was accomplished. That was what reconciliation means, okay? Uh, Apocatalasso, an exchange, okay? Uh, Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blemish and unreprovable before him if, you can circle that if there because it is conditional, if so be that you continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See? See? Now, there's two things mentioned here, faith and hope, right? Listen to what he says again. If so be that you continue in the faith, that is, calling the things that be not as though they were, because they were. At the cross, we were delivered from the curse of sin and death. Uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made you free from the curse of sin and death. So, if so be that you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, that's different. See, faith looks back, but hope looks forward. Hope is a firm expectation. You know, the people who believe by faith that Christ took away their sins, that he bore their sins in his body, past tense, you know, and by whose stripes you were healed, the people that believe that also have hope. In other words, they have a firm expectation of something that's coming down the road. See, one looks back, one looks forward. And what the Lord spoke to me one time is everyone who has faith has hope, but not everyone who has hope has faith. Okay, many people hope for something they don't ever expect to get. See, but this is a firm expectation. We, this is someone who is believing that something is coming down the road. What is it? It's the it's the fulfillment of the gospel. See, we have faith for the gospel. We accept the good news that Christ, that we were crucified with Christ and that we don't live anymore, and that the old man has passed away. We accept that good news. But we also expect it to come to pass. That's where the hope comes in, the hope of the gospel. We have a firm expectation that the Lord who began a good work in us will fulfill it unto the day of Jesus Christ. This is the true gospel, folks. The false gospel is you, when you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, all of which words are not even in the Bible, by the way, uh, that you got everything you're going to get. Have you ever heard that preached? Well, that's a lying devil right there. That's one of the devil's emissaries. He fashions his ministers as ministers of righteousness. See? No, you didn't get everything you're going to get. You only got a down payment. That's what the Bible says, you know. God's going to finish the good work he started in you if you give him the faith, you know. And so um, let me point out something else to you here. Uh, another verse that's also uses this terminology. Um, well, I'm going to go on with um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. On verse 15, it says, For we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God in them that are saved 
or are being saved, okay, and in them that are perishing. To one, a saver from death unto death, and the other, a saver of life unto life. And the numerics, the received text, the Nestle's text all agree that this is them that are perishing and them that are being saved. Okay. Uh, the three most ancient manuscripts agree being saved. No place in the Bible does it say you are saved except by faith. If any of you have ever asked God for something, you know, like Jesus said in Mark 11 and 24, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them. That also is numeric. Received, past tense, is numeric right there. And you shall have them, he said. And why is it that he says that? Because we did receive them. We received everything at the cross. Uh, we were crucified with Christ, and we were resurrected with Christ. It is now Christ that lives in us, according to Galatians 2 and 20. We received it all. And so uh, anything we pray for, we believe we received. That's what faith is. Faith calls the things that be not as though they were. Faith uh, is the substance of the thing hoped for while there's no evidence yet. See? So faith, we're justified by faith because we're receiving a substance because of our faith. God reckons righteousness to unto, unto us. That's what justified means. He reckons righteousness unto us because we believe that Christ took away our sins and that he delivered us from the curse. He reckons righteousness to us. And so salvation, when you believe for something, any of you out there that have been healed, for instance, you, you ask the Lord to heal you and you walk by faith. And if you continue in your faith, God always does it, right? All right. So, uh, again, faith is the substance while the evidence isn't seen. But faith is a means to an end and the end being the true substance of the thing you're hoping for, right? Well, salvation is the same way. When you first come to Christ, let me give you a revelation. You're accepting God's salvation by faith. You say, uh, uh David, I got something. Well, I did too. I got a new spirit. But then Jesus spoke about and spoke to his disciples, who, by the way, the Bible says they followed him in the regeneration, which means new birth. He said, you who have followed me in the regeneration, meaning new birth. The disciples who walked with Jesus, they were born again. But they didn't have everything the Lord had to give them. They were entering into it as they walked by faith. And they were manifesting more and more of the wisdom of Christ, which was being sown in their heart. You know, he, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And the Lord's spirit and life in his words were going into them and recreating himself in them. First spirit, but then soul and ultimately body. You know, those who have borne the fruit of their spirit in their soul, 30, 60, and 100 fold, that is the fruit of the spirit. Those are the works of Christ. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you ever notice that, what it says about salvation there in Romans? Let's go there just for a minute. This is very interesting. Romans 13, verse 11. And this knowing the season that already it is time for you to awake out of sleep. For now is salvation nearer to us than when we first believed. Wow, you see that? Salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. You know, they had a hope for something that was coming down the road, you see. And uh, the fullness of of God's salvation is now nearer to us than when we first believed, you see. Um, verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Salvation 
is nearer to us than when we first believed because we are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, um, there, I know that we've been talking about demons in uh, the real good news here, but I'm kind of tying it together with the direction I'm going in, and that is talking about the fullness of Christ in us. This is my favorite subject <laughs> because I love to think on those things, you know. But um, um, we had a lady come here one time. Um, she only came one time. Matter of fact, it was another one of those instances where we were talking about the gospel. And um, the lady hit the floor probably about you know, 15, 20 foot away from me, she hit the floor on her knees and ran around a table on her knees and ran up to me and my wife who were sitting next to one another. And this woman's eyes were just glaring. It was hatred in her eyes, you know. And she stuck her hands out towards my neck because she wanted to choke me. And she, she looked over at my wife and she says, don't you know I could just choke your husband to death? <laughs> and my wife said no you can't do that and I said nope you can't do that and I forget what all I said but as soon as I refused her well she got back up like she was in her right mind and you know just looked around and she walked over and sat back down There's, there are people in this room right now that remember seeing this well you know um, the devil hates people who preach the gospel. He, he'll make war on people that preach the gospel. I'm talking about the real gospel. He hates this. He hates this revelation getting out to the church. You know, he's the God of Babylon, the Bible says. And um, he's the king of Babylon, I should say. He's the God of this world, but he's the king of Babylon, identified twice in the scriptures for that. Um, he wants to rule. He wants to exalt his throne, as that verse says over the stars of God. And he doesn't want anybody plundering him, you know, but the Lord Jesus has given us the authority to plunder his kingdom. And the gospel is the main means of doing that, plundering his kingdom. It's the power of God unto salvation, and salvation being, as we just saw in Romans 13, salvation being the manifestation of Christ in you. We're putting on Christ, right? That's God's salvation. You look at Jesus and you see what salvation is. And they call the, the early Christians Christians because they walked in his steps. They spoke as he spoke. They had power as he had power. And um, they showed, they were witnesses of him. Meaning, of course, people looked at them and they saw Jesus. That's what it is. They didn't just witness. They were witnesses, you see. They looked at these people and they called them Christians because they were Christ-like. And I dare say, you know, the overwhelming majority of Christianity could never be accused of that nowadays. You know, the truth is, that's where we're headed back to, folks. Um, the Lord in these days is going to do a work that many will not believe. They didn't believe when Jesus came the first time. Let me read to you from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. You know, can you imagine these demon-possessed people, who he said was sons of their father the devil, had the Lord Jesus Christ standing in their midst, and um, they thought he had demons. But listen to this, verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believed because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. You know, the Lord is giving special grace in these days to finish his salvation. We're nearer to salvation than when we first believed to finish his salvation in his people. And it's Jesus coming to be glorified in his saints that he's speaking about. He goes on to say in verse 11, To which end we also pray always for you, that our God 
me count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness. See, he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is what salvation is all about in the new covenant. When you're out from under the law, this is how it works. He works in you to will. He gives you a desire of goodness. And then he works in you to do. He brings it to pass. Right? Every desire of goodness and every work of faith. Wow. You know, was was he paying, playing, was he uh, uh, praying a prayer that was um, impossible? Wouldn't make good sense, would it? He was praying something that was according to the will of God. There's a numeric pattern in this too, right? Um, let me read that again. To which end, we also pray always for you that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness and every work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, according to the grace of our God. It's not according to our works. Many people complain that we can never be perfect. We can never manifest Christ. We'll always be sinners saved by grace, which the Bible doesn't say. Because the only hope they have is their own power. What is it about some Christians that they don't understand that it has nothing to do with our power? By grace have you been saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. But it has nothing to do with our power. It has to do with God's power. Can you tell God that he's not able to do this thing? If, if he's not able to do this thing, why is Paul praying for it? Does he not have good sense? Now, listen. That the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and ye in him. The name of our Lord Jesus. The word name, onoma, means nature, character, and authority. The nature, character, and authority of Jesus Christ be glorified in you. That's God's plan. And when did he say this was going to happen? Well, if you look at the text from verse 10 on up, you find out that he's talking about the days before the coming of the Lord. These are the days that God's going to do this. These are the days he's going to finish his creation. You know, we're still in the creation process here, folks. Um, some people think that we're in plan B because plan A didn't work. Adam fell and God's plan was thwarted. But that's ridiculous. You know, Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world before Adam fell. A sacrifice was made for us. And, and God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before Adam fell, he knew we needed a Savior. And he chose us to be in him, in that Savior. We're not in plan A. In plan B, we're in plan A. Okay? And God doesn't have plan Bs. Okay? So, so if God planned for us to be in this state and he planned for there to be a first Adam and a last Adam called Jesus Christ, right? And uh, the last Adam is the father of the born again creation that's born in the image of God, the true image of God. People say, well, Adam was born in the image of God. Yes, but naturally, not spiritually. Now we're talking about the born again image of God, the true image of God, the true sons of God. We're awaiting the manifestation, Romans chapter 8, of the sons of God. Um, so that the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glory of the liberty of the children of God. You see, folks, the manifestation of sonship is what God's interested in. He wants, to, he wants Jesus to be the firstborn among many brethren, the Bible says. He came... Um, he came to be God's karagma, his image. And uh, in that case, the word karagma means uh, a, a tool, a character, a tool to recreate itself. You see, that's what Jesus was. Jesus was God's tool to recreate himself in us. You see, 
And he is also the father of the born-again creation, the last Adam. It is God's plan that we come into his image. And we've been sold far short by the uh, preachers of the gospel that just went and weren't sent. Uh, they were sent by men. Um, they have preached an antichrist gospel that is keeping God's people from coming into his image. And he says here, that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. And in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, it says, We all with an unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are transformed into that same image from glory to glory as from the Lord the Spirit. You see, folks, as we behold in a mirror, that is, we behold by faith that we no longer live and Christ lives in us, as we hold fast this gospel, Colossians 1, 21, 22 says, as we hold fast to the faith of this gospel, the Lord is going to be bringing us from glory to glory into his image and uh, uh, manifesting his name in us. You know, when we went down in the waters of baptism, we took on his name. We were baptized literally, the Bible says, into his name, not in his name, the word there is into. Numerics proves it. We're baptized into his name, which means what? Into his nature, character, and authority. The plan of the Lord is that we do the greater works in these days. Not that we do them, but that he do it in us. When we put our faith in him, He's going to fulfill in us every, what, desire of goodness and every work of faith with power so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. God bless you, saints. I hope you're catching hold of this. This is a wonderful thing, a wonderful truth. God bless you. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.